The River Annan, known locally as Annan Water, flows through the landscape and history of the southern uplands. The River Annan is a gateway river, and for centuries it's provided a thoroughfare for people and goods travelling between England and Scotland. Rivers are the life-giving arteries of history. The enduring force of the seaward flow has shaped Scotland's landscape. The first people to settle here used rivers as natural highways. They settled along their banks where towns and cities grew. In this series, I'm travelling along the course of our great waterways, meeting the people who live and work here, uncovering intriguing tales from the past and experiencing the glories of the ever-changing scene. In this programme, I'm setting off down the River Annan on a grand tour that weaves a route through time. My route begins in the hills north of the town of Moffat, finds solace at a former prisoner of war camp and acquires a taste for devil's porridge. Journey's end is the briny waters of the Solway Firth. The track I'm following forms part of the long distance path called the Annandale Way. It climbs along the ridge to Annanhead Hill with a steep drop of over 200 metres on its southern side. The steep-sided hills here were formed long ago by the action of ancient glaciers which carved out a great natural amphitheatre which is known today as the Devil's Beef Tub. According to local tradition, the Beef Tub got its name from the notorious Johnson clan, one of the border reaving families whose cattle thieving exploits earned them the nickname Devils to their enemies. Walking along the rim of the beef tub, you can see why it was such a good place to keep stolen livestock. The cattle would have been well hidden, while the views from up here command the upper valley of the River Annan. Anyone approaching would have been easily spotted. It's the highest ground for kilometres and forms the watershed, dictating which way rain flows to reach the sea. Three important Scottish rivers rise within just a few square kilometres of each other in this part of southern Scotland. Now, not far away is the source of the River Tweed, which flows east, and then to the north and west is the source of the River Clyde, which eventually flows into the Atlantic Ocean to the west. While behind me, on the steep slopes of the Devil's Beef Tub, is the source of the south-flowing River Annan. Let's see if I can go and find it. The Annan source rises at over 400 metres, so I don't have to descend far to find what I'm looking for. A spring of pure, clear water. Now, this has to be it. Yes, definitely. Now, it's amazing to think that this is the birthplace of the River Annan. It doesn't look much, just seeping down from some boggy ground above, forming this wee trickle, but from here, it flows into the Devil's Beef Tub where it's joined by other streams and burns and then on towards the Solway Firth, 65 kilometres away. Making my way down the bare hillside, I follow the infant Annan to the farmland below. Here, a group of volunteers are busy planting trees along the banks of one of the river's tributaries to restore the area's native woodland. To find out how this will affect the whole river system, I meet up with Fee Martinoga. Fee, I've always thought of the borders here as a landscape devoid of trees, bare hillsides, but it hasn't always been like that, has it? It certainly hasn't always been like that, no. We've become very accustomed to it because they've been grazed heavily for actually millennia now. If you went back, say, 6,000 years, yes. what would the landscape here have been like? We would have had um, a variously wooded hillsides with lots of birch, oak, hazel, holly. Um, in the damp ground you'd have had alder and willow. How do we know this? One of the main reasons is because of core sampling and then analysing the pollen. 
Holland survives through the Holland ages. Holland survives in pretty style. well. So what we have here is a denuded landscape. It is a very denuded landscape. And of course, it's, it's um, the rest of the world suffers because it's denuded. It, it's not really a natural landscape and it's got very little variety in it. And the water just rushes off it. With more extreme rainfall events caused by climate change, tree planting is a natural way to help absorb more water in the upper catchment of the river. Now we've got a couple of wee trees here. Yeah, we have. Uh, what are they? What have we got? Um, well, what we've got in front of us is some little eared willows, which are ideal for this wet habitat and uh -huh. you know, obviously very good at soaking up moisture because that's what they like. Right. Well, what do I do to plant it? You need to clear the grass a bit. It's called screefing. Have you done this before? No, I haven't. No. So you're, you're taking that top layer of grass off and trying to make a bit of a hole. And then you go down with the spear and wobble it about. So we're making a deep hole. So I'm going to pop this into the hole and then I'm going to just firm it in with my fingers. And then I'm going to do a bit of treading in. Make it looks so simple, but you're going to have to do this thousands of times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Satisfied with my small contribution to the river's ecosystem, I've returned to the main course of the Annan, which crosses a final bridge as it flows into the town of Moffat. Moffat developed at a strategic position on the main route between England and Scotland and became heavily involved in the sheep and wool trade in the 19th century. To commemorate the importance of this relationship, a local businessman commissioned a monument to be erected in the old marketplace. Now, this is it, the mighty Moffat Ram. It was produced by the great sculptor William Brodie, who also created Greyfriars Bobby in Edinburgh. But unlike the wee bronze Westie in the capital, this impressive ram is actually anatomically deficient. When it was unveiled, or so the story goes, a local farmer shouted out, It has nail lugs! And indeed it doesn't, at least none that I can see. Although to be fair, if it had any ears, they would be hidden by those massive and impressive spiral horns. While sheep might have been a cause for celebration in Moffat, they weren't the only reason folk flocked to the town. It was also a spa. The curative waters came from a natural mineral spring lying close to a tributary of the River Annan. To find out about its healing powers, I'm going in search of what's left of the Moffat well in the company of local historian Graham Campbell. Who discovered the well? Uh, it was a lady by the name of Rachel Whiteford, who was the daughter of the local minister. Uh -huh. And she was a, a well-travelled, well-educated lady who uh, came upon the, the spring popping out of the rock and uh, realised its potential health benefits for the people of the town. And she recognised its importance right away? Yes, I think she'd been around Europe and seen other spa sites. Graham wants to show me the pavilion built to collect the special water. I have to say, it's a rather disappointing spectacle. The well water is slowly seeping into a trough full of stagnant water and green slime. Is this it then? Yes, this is the original shelter built around the, the spring water. And these are the famous waters? I'm afraid so. There is definitely an aroma. But yet people flocked here for a cure. What's in the water? There's a mixture of hydrogen sulfide gas uh -huh. and carbon dioxide, along with right. calcium, magnesium, and potassium sulfate salts and chloride salts. And what's uh, it good for? Well, there, there were certainly laxative properties <laughs> associated with it. Right. Is that you why know, people came here? Part, Slight constipation would be solved. Yes. It was mainly used for a variety of skin conditions. Um, Originally, when the well was discovered, there were still individuals with leprosy. Really? And, uh, yes. Would you drink this water or would you bathe in it? Both, yes. Uh -huh. Was it a popular spa resort? Well, it, Is it, that too grand a description? 
by the 18th, middle of the 18th century, it was becoming so. Moffat's fame spread far and wide, with visitors from all over the world coming to sample its healing waters. And from the late 19th century, the place to stay was the Grand Hydropathic Hotel. It was a very opulent hotel. It had its own uh, indoor swimming pool, uh, ballroom, tennis courts, bowling greens, smoking rooms. Smoking room in a yes, health resort. <laughs> exactly. Uh, later on, it was considered secondary only to, to Harrogate in Yorkshire. You're joking, as a spa really? Time. Yes. Really? So Moffat was maybe a, that was self-promotion. An important destination on the, on the spa circuit. It was for some people, yes. It's hard to believe that this slimy, stinky water would do anything but give you an upset stomach. But I'm throwing caution to the wind to sample the once famous spa waters. That's quite good, isn't it? It's not bad at all, oh. really. But cheers. Cheers. To your good health. And yours. <laughs> I feel surprisingly invigorated by the medicinal waters and leave the town with a spring in my step. From Moffat, I follow the course of the river south, under the A74 motorway to Loch Mabon, a town nestling among lochs which all drain into the Annan. All of them would have been familiar to the mighty Robert the Bruce, hero of Scottish independence. Born into the Scottish aristocracy, Bruce had claims to the Scottish throne and led an historic victory over a much larger English army at Bannockburn. Legend has it that Bruce was born at Loch Mabon. But the Bruce family weren't always rooted in or rooting for Scotland. Historian Fiona Watson leads me to the remains of a royal stronghold on the banks of Castle Loch, where she reveals a troubling account of the Bruce. Fiona, a lot of Scots may be dismayed to learn that the Bruce family and Robert the Bruce himself are not quite as Scottish as they might have hoped. Well, actually, like many of the Scottish nobles of this period, um, at least the, the paternal line, because we shouldn't forget about the mothers, um, the paternal line originally came from Normandy. So in this castle here, in the Great Hall, you would have heard Norman French. You definitely would. There's no doubt that the aristocracy of Western Europe spoke French. They would almost certainly have, have spoken local languages as well. So the Bruces were part of the Anglo-Norman bunch that came into Scotland. Absolutely. They drifted up to Scotland with David I. Do you think it's safe to say in that case that the Bruces had, what, divided loyalties? And that's an interesting question. To begin with, at least, um, even under David I, because he fought the King of England, the, the Bruces sided with the English King, probably right. because he's the bigger player. Right. And they felt beholden to him. That's how they'd come into the British Isles. So, so that's what they did. But by the time of William the Lion, so the turn of, of the 13th century, they are siding with the Scottish Kings, the Scottish branch anyway. So they've become Scottish. Uh -huh. The family may have become Scottish in their allegiance, but how Scottish was the Bruce? There are several places in Scotland that lay claim to being the birthplace of Robert the Bruce. There's Loch Mabon here. It's got a statue of Robert the Bruce outside the town hall. Somewhere in Ayrshire, it's Turnberry, I think, lays claim to Robert the Bruce. But there could be another alternative which might upset people considerably. This is true. It's, it's, it's kind of embarrassing, I know, um, and difficult for, for many Scots to swallow, but it, we don't have a birth certificate. We don't know for certain. Uh, but in the absence of, of much evidence, we do have some snippet in, a, in an English chronicle written slightly later, just in passing, that Robert Bruce, the king, um, was born in Essex. In Essex? Yeah. Right. But he, um, Robert the Bruce, is, is the quintessential Scot. He is the hero of Scottish independence. He's this mighty figure. Mm. And for you to say that in actual fact, well, he spoke French and he was born in Essex, I mean, that confuses, muddies the waters somewhat. Oh, but that's history for you. I mean, there's muddy water <laughs> everywhere. What do you think of Robert the Bruce? I don't think he gets enough credit for being very, very innovative and, and, and tr a tremendous military leader. He should be right up there with the Napoleons of this world. Um, and, of course, at this point in time, that's exactly what Scotland needed. A hero. A hero. <laughs> <laughs> and just because you're born in Essex doesn't 
preclude you from matter. being a hero. We shouldn't. It doesn't matter where you're born. It's what you do that counts. <laughs> Contemplating the shocking thought of a Dell boy Scottish king, I leave Loch Maben and head for the Annan once again. Here the river weaves its way through farmland, where its changing course has formed tight loops. In some places, the river has cut through the bends and left behind a freestanding, crescent-shaped body of water called an Oxbow Lake. Today, the surrounding fields are empty, but 75 years ago, hundreds of Ukrainian men worked this land alongside local farmers. They were prisoners of war, living at Holmure, and this unassuming hut is all that's left of the camp that stood here following the Second World War. Its exterior belies the magic of what's contained within. An extraordinary place of worship, this is the Ukrainian chapel. Peter Kormelo, who is the son of one of the men who lived here, tells me more. Peter, there's been a long association between this part of Scotland and the Ukraine. How did it all begin? That began when 465 Ukrainian prisoners of war were brought to this camp. They were brought here from Italy. So what, what were the Ukrainian soldiers doing uh, at that time in Italy? My father and his colleagues volunteered for the German army in order to fight the Soviets. Right. At the end of the war, the Ukrainians did not lay down their arms. They fought their way through the Austrian Alps and surrendered to the Brits in uh, the Drau Valley. Mm -hmm. And from there, they were put in a prison camp in Italy for two years. Uh -huh. So that's why they arrived here in 1947 and right. not 45. So they arrived here as part of a government campaign to um, assist with the manpower or the lack of manpower in Scotland. And what was life like for them here? Well, when you fought on the Russian front and it got down to hand-to-hand -hand combat and you lost so many friends, a place like this offering the sanctuary that offered, it was paradise. And the farmers loved them because the men were just happy to work. No bullets or grenades. There weren't guards or anything? No. A perimeter fence or no. dogs? No. And... no, nothing like that. Uh, there was nothing like that. They felt totally free to come and go in this camp. And would they have mingled with the local population, do you think? Yes, they did. And that's, that's why I'm here, because... <laughs> because of the mingling. <laughs> because of the mingling. <laughs> The highlight of their Saturday was they were allowed the evening's freedom. And of course, they had to make sure that they could do the dance of the time. Right. Uh, their social life and cultural life revolved around this camp. So this was home for them? This was home. Well, it's a very special place. It's unique, really, isn't it? And it's got a fantastic atmosphere and an extraordinary history. The chapel is still a focal point for the Ukrainian community and has been a source of aid during the war with Russia. Leaving Holmur, I head south along the river once more, towards a village which may also have a sacred origin, Ekel Fekin. For many years, I thought that Ekel Fekin was a swear word, an archaic expletive. But not at all. It seems that it comes from an ancient Celtic language, meaning little church. But having said that, I've since learned that the good folk of Echel Fecken refer to their village affectionately as Fecken, as in, he's a Fecken man or she's a Fecken woman. In the village, I cross the wee burn that feeds into the Annan and go in search of a famous Fecken son, Thomas Carlyle, who, you might ask, to discover more about him, I've come to the place where Carlisle was born in 1795. David Stothard is on hand to tell me more about this great man. 
David. A lot of people have never heard of Carlyle, but in Victorian times, he was one of the preeminent writers and thinkers and philosophers. What was he famous for? Um, well, his, his first works were translations of German texts. Um, and then he sort of moved into a kind of satirical writing. And then from there, he that's when he branched into history and philosophical thinking. He wrote uh, three volumes on the French Revolution. He was partway through the third one, and a maid mistook the first volume for rubbish and threw it on the fire. So he finished the third and went back and wrote the first from scratch. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, can you just tell me a wee bit about the great man theory of history, which I think that Carlyle was responsible for. He mm -hmm. certainly promoted it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the way history was told. Um, history was always uh, great men saving the, the little guys underneath. Uh, history was always great men ruling. I think it's a 19th century mindset. But it's one that kind of persisted in the 20th century. He had some, some big fans in Germany, uh, and particularly the Reich Chancellery. From what I've read, it's one of the last things uh, Goebbels was reading in the bunker. And from what I've read of the situation, he was given it by Hitler. To what extent was he influential in the things that he was writing? I think it, it all stems from the fact that he was known for only saying things that are worth saying. So, I mean, the phrase, silence is golden, was Thomas Carlyle. The, really? The original phrase <laughs> was, silence is golden, speech is silver. The, the words gullible and giggly uh -huh. um, are credited to Thomas Carlyle. Really? Mm. Yeah. Do you think he was a great man? His effect on those who came after him is what makes him great, rather than him himself and his works that make him great. We wouldn't have had uh, A Tale of Two Cities by uh, Charles Dickens without him. That was based on the French Revolution. The writing style of J.M. Barry was based off of his learnings of Carlyle. And some of the things that we have because of him mm -hmm. are great. Following Carlyle's advice, I go in search of my own bit of golden silence. Seven kilometres from the river mouth, the secluded backwaters of the Annan are a perfectly tranquil haven. Less than two kilometres from the Solway, the river passes the town with which it shares its name, Annan. Today, all seems calm, but a hundred years or so ago, residents complained of nightly chaos as thousands of labourers came looking for entertainment in local bars. It was like the Wild West. This was during the early days of the First World War, when tens of thousands of navvies, as labourers were called back then, were engaged in a vast engineering project to build the biggest armaments factory in the world. In just over a year, the work was done, and a new industrial military complex was operational, employing thousands of young women to produce what was known then as the Devil's Porridge. To find out about the massive factory that made this curious substance close to the Annan, I'm meeting up with Dr Laura Noakes. What is Devil's Porridge? So, the Devil's Porridge is what Arthur Conan Doyle um, called this mixture here when he came to the mm -hmm. factory in 1916 when he was a war correspondent. It's basically nitric cotton mixed with acid um, and this will eventually be dried and turned into cordite which actually looks like a tiny kind of dried spaghetti mm -hmm. stick and that cordite will then go into shells, into bullets and it's the propellant which pushes the explosive out of the shell. How many workers were involved, you know? So 30,000 people worked in total at the factory, and 12,000 of those were women. Most of those women were young, they were single, they were working class, and they were away from home for the first time. And a lot of these women lived in hostels, and these were purpose-built hostels with matrons. They had certain times they had to come back for. If they came back by nine o'clock, some of the women got a kind of cookie and a glass of milk at the end of the night. Right. Um, Was that your reward? Yes, for, for making <laughs> I didn't curfew. stay out all night dancing and drinking. I came, came home back. for a cookie exactly. and a glass of milk. I would have thought that for those in charge, policing morals might have been an important consideration. Absolutely, and actually Gretna had one of the largest units of women police officers here at the factory, um, which in itself was an innovation because prior to the war there weren't women police. There must have been a hazardous 
occupational. When you first started working with the corda, it gave you an absolutely terrible headache. It was the fumes were just mm -hmm. very overpowering, and then as as, as 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 they went on continuing to work here, the headache happened when they weren't near the fumes. So to cure your headache, you'd actually come to work. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Appreciating the girls' dangerous contribution to the war effort, which also helped women achieve the right to vote, I leave Laura and arrive at Journey's End, the Solway Firth. It's a coastline that can be both wild and bleak, especially on a day like today. But these were characteristics that made it attractive to smugglers and their tax-dodging trade. Our national poet, Robert Burns, knew this stretch of the coast really well. It was part of his beat as an exciseman or customs officer when he was staying at Dumfries just a few miles away. Now one night he famously took part in a daring raid on a smuggling ship close to the mouth of the River Annan here. It was an experience that inspired the song that deals a war with excisemen. Not long afterwards, in July 1796, Burns returned under very different circumstances. He was seriously ill. In fact, he was dying. However, his doctor had diagnosed gout and thought that a course of water therapy would cure his ills, just as Moffat's spa waters had for others. So poor, unfortunate Burns would walk in a nightshirt towards the cold grey Solway and the incoming tide. Burns subjected himself to this gruelling regime for almost a week. And to better understand what it must have been like for the poor poet, I'm going to um, attempt to follow his footsteps across the wet sand and the mud, down to the water's edge, and then possibly into the sea. One of the disadvantages of sea bathing along this stretch of the coast is the shallow water. You have to wade out some distance before it's deep enough to take a dunk. It's also very muddy and on the chilly side. But nothing ventured, nothing gained, as Burns probably said to himself. Tragically, Burns's doctor had given him a completely wrong diagnosis and bathing in freezing cold seawater was definitely not going to help his condition and within just a week of the poet's last dunk, he was dead. Which makes this a rather sombre place for me to end my grand tour down the River Annan. I really don't think this is good for you. On my next grand tour, I'm discovering a rich literary landscape as I head east along the River North Esk. <laughs> <laughs>